the year was 1968, the date December 17. Barbara Mackel was a student at Emory University there in Atlanta, and she had become sick with the flu, and so her mother came to pick her up early and was going to take her home. As they were staying in a roadway hotel in Duluth, Georgia, a knock came on the door. And as Barbara opened the door, the people on the other end said, we're the police. And one of Barbara's friends has been in a very terrible accident. We need to talk to her immediately. As they entered that small hotel room, they chloroformed Barbara's mother. She passed out instantly, and Barbara was taken kidnapped. And as she was kidnapped, in fact, uh, one newspaper put it this way, a kidnapping with Deltona ties gripped the nation 50 years ago was actually 50 years after the event happened. Barbara was the 20-year-old daughter of a millionaire real estate developer in Florida. The kidnappers put Barbara in the trunk of the car and uh, they sped her away to a very distant site in the woods of Georgia. Once they were there, they took Barbara, who was from Miami, and they placed her in a pine box that uh, had a battery-powered fan. It had some water with some sedatives in it, and it had a little bit of food. Barbara was buried in the hills of Georgia, and she actually survived 83 hours in that pine box. The kidnappers sent a message to her parents, and they said, if you will send us $500,000, we will then give you a map and let you know where Barbara is hiding. Now, the first attempt to pay off these kidnappers failed. But the authorities found the car, and in that car, there was a photo of Barbara with a sign on her that said, kidnapped. They began to search frantically, and eventually, a switchboard operator took a message from those kidnappers, and uh, they, the ransom money was provided, and Barbara was found alive. It was an absolutely amazing journey for her. The ransom was paid, the girl was found, a glorious reunion took place in the Mackle family that holiday season. Now, here's my question for you. Do you think Barbara woke up one day after her release wondering, I wonder, does my father love me? I mean, does my father care for me? You think Barbara woke up one morning and was raising that question. Now, let me ask you another question, though. Are you that valuable? Let's suppose somebody kidnapped you, and let's suppose a ransom note came. Would somebody pay the equivalent of $3.6 million for you? Are, are you that valuable? Would they actually pay a ransom price so expensive for you? Somebody said, no, no, Pastor Mark, I don't think so. Maybe they might pay five bucks to get me back, maybe ten dollars, you know, maybe, maybe twenty-five dollars, but nobody would pay that much money for me. But here's the incredible good news. A costly ransom was paid for you. A ransom of infinite price was paid for you a ransom that was much, much more than $3.6 million. The ransom of Christ on Calvary is spoken about in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. Can you read it with me, please, from the screen? For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without spot or blemish, his sacrifice for you was much more than a ransom that was worth $3.6 million. The precious Son of God left the glories and splendor of heaven, 
He tabernacled in human flesh. He faced the enemy on the enemy's ground. He resisted every temptation of evil. And as he overcame, he overcame for you and for me. And with nails driven through his hands and a crown of thorns placed upon his head and blood dropping from his brow and spurting from his hands and pouring from his feet, the divine Son of God, this Christ worshipped by all the angels, this Christ at whose very word angels sang, holy, 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 this Jesus who existed from eternity with the Father, this Christ hung on a cross called Calvary and died on a mountain called Golgotha. Our planet was caught in the grip of sin, condemned to eternal death, kidnapped by a devilish invader. But heaven provided the costliest ransom imaginable, the divine Son of God. There was nothing more that heaven could have done. There was nothing more that heaven could have provided. Heaven provided everything for you. Were you worth that ransom? Do you think you were worth what Jesus paid for you? Somebody said, no, pastor, I'm not worth it. If you were not worth it, then he got cheated, right? If you were not worth the price he paid, then he got cheated. But Jesus thinks you were worth it. You are worth a lot more than you'll ever recognize. You, will, you are worth a lot more than you ever know. To heaven, there's nothing that heaven would have done that could have been done to save you. You're worth that much. You are that valuable to heaven. Jesus believes that you are worth every drop of blood he shed for you. That's why the price he paid was so high. And that's the message of the sanctuary. The message of the sanctuary is a message of love beyond comprehension. The message of the sanctuary is the message of a Christ who in miniature and shadow form reveals to you and me the price, the worth that we have, the point of salvation as revealed in the sanctuary, foreshadows Christ's sacrifice for sin in his high priestly ministry in heaven's sanctuary, which provides both ransom and reunion. The purpose of the ransom is for a reunion. Have you ever put anything on layaway plan? Now, when we were growing up, I remember I was a college student, and I learned that my wife needed a winter coat, and I wanted to impress her because we were just dating at the time. Now, as a college student, I didn't have the money to buy that winter coat that she needed, but I did have five dollars, so I remember going down to J.C. Penney's. Now, you say you weren't very extravagant to buy a coat in J.C. Penney's. Look, I was a college student. That was all the money I had. So I went down, and I, I was so proud. I went down to J.C. Penney's, and I said, I'm going to put that coat on layaway. I did it about five months ahead of time, gave them $5. Next month, took a little bit of savings, had a little more, $7.50. Next month, came down with $8. By the end of those five months, I had that coat paid for. Now, let me ask you this. If I paid for the coat, you think I was going to go pick it up? If I paid for that coat, you think I was going to leave it there for somebody else to get? When Christ hung on Calvary, he paid a ransom for you. And that's why he's coming back. Because you are too valuable not to take home. Where there is a ransom, there must be a reunion. That's what Jesus' high priestly ministry is all about in heaven's sanctuary. Jesus is the lamb that dies, but Jesus is the priest that lives. Jesus died for us, but Jesus lives for us. Jesus' death in his life is doing everything he can because he wants one thing. He wants to embrace you one day. He wants to say, welcome home, my child, one day. He wants to put his arms around you in love one day. And that is the message of the sanctuary. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says, Christ has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. So there Christ, the sinless one, must take the sinner's place. The righteous one must take the place of the unrighteous. The just must take the place of the unjust. Here, 
Christ the sinless one takes our place. From the day that man fell, God sought to reveal his wonderful plan. In the sacrificial system, he showed that he would accept a substitute in the sinner's place. The whole purpose of the sanctuary is to show that God accepts a substitute. If you and I had to bear the guilt, if you and I had to bear the shame, if you and I had to bear the condemnation of our sin, there is no price that we could pay to ransom our souls. Absolutely impossible. The price is too high because what's the price of sin? The wages of sin is what? Death. So if we had to pay the price, it's eternal death. It's going into the grave and never, ever, ever coming out. So the price is much, much, much too high. But Christ, hanging on Calvary's cross, revealed in the sacrificial system, showed that, that heaven would accept a substitute in our place. The sanctuary service more fully revealed the significance of the plan of salvation. Now, as lambs were brought to this court, the sinner looked up and saw the tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle had four coverings. Here, we have pulled them back in the graphic. The first covering was badger's skin. The second was ram skin dyed red. The third was goat's skin, white. The fourth was a purple tapestry. From every aspect of the sanctuary, we see Jesus and Jesus revealed. The outmost covering was very plain, this badger skin, or some translations say seal skin. It represents Christ, who had no beauty that we should desire Him. The darkness represents the Christ that would come and tabernacle in human flesh, the one that would be the root out of dry ground, the one that would bear sin for us. So the outer represents Christ bearing the darkness of our sin and guilt. But what about the ram skin dyed red? That reminds us of the ram provided as a substitute for Isaac. And you remember Abraham was taking Isaac there on Mount Moriah. And the boy says, where is the sacrifice? And Abraham says, God himself shall provide a lamb. And then there's the ram caught in the thicket. The ram's covering here dyed in, in red represents that sacrifice of Christ provided for us. What about the covering of fine twine linen? It represents these white curtains next and the fine linen and the goat's hair next. That white represents the fact that Jesus Christ would come as our righteousness. He would bring his people, his church together as a body united in his righteousness. So we go from the darkness of sin, the humanity of Christ bearing sin, to the sacrifice of Christ on the cross to create righteousness for us so that the inmost covering is all glorious. It speaks of the beauty of Christ-like character. It speaks of the fact in that purple and the gold twine that we can be sons and daughters of God. So every Every aspect of the sanctuary takes us from sin to the sacrifice of Christ, to righteousness, to the royal family of God. God wants to do something in your life that is beyond imaginable, something in your life that is beyond what we can conceive. Now let's go back here to this altar of burnt offering in the court. There were multiple types of sacrifices. There were bullocks and cows. There were lambs and goats. There were there was a grain offering. There were turtle doves. Why? Because God is revealing that there is provision for all. There is provision for every man, woman, and child. And if you're too poor to bring a lamb, you can bring a pigeon. If you're too poor to bring a pigeon, you can bring a grain offering. If you're too poor to do that, you go out and catch a wild turtle dove. Now, when the sacrifice was slain here, notice Leviticus 4 verse 3. He shall lay his hand upon the head of the sin offering. What does it mean before the sinner confesses his sin that he lays his hand upon the offering? All throughout the Bible, when you lay your hand upon a lamb, when you lay your hand upon the offering, that is a sign of ownership. That's a sign of ownership. It's a sign of the transferring of ownership. Ownership. 
So the symbolism here is the sinner lays his hand upon the lamb. He is transferring the ownership of this animal to the priest. When he confesses his sin, that sin then is transferred to the lamb and the ownership of that sin, the ownership of that guilt, the ownership of that condemnation is no longer on the sinner. He no longer owns it. It now is on the lamb. Here's the incredible good news. When you confess your sin and you confess your guilt and you confess your shame, you don't own it anymore. You don't own it anymore. Did you ever read, I read an interesting story. You may have read it. A young man in Africa, he has just uh, cut down a lot of wood for, for fire. And he's taking it back to his little hut. And he has this pack of wood on his back. And he's walking like this, you know, this pack of wood. And some guy comes down the road with a wagon. And the guy waves to him. And the wagon pulls over and stops. And the wagon driver said, would you like a ride? And the man said, oh man, if I could only have a ride. He's sweating. He's been walking two miles, three miles, and he has this load on his back. He gets into the wagon, and they're going along, and the man still has the load on his back, and he's sitting there all hunched over this big load, and the wagon driver looks back on him and says, why don't you put your load down? And the man says, you've been so kind to give me a ride. At least I can do is carry my own load. Some of you are carrying your own load. You've confessed your sin, but yet you feel guilty. You confessed your sin, yet your, your brain condemns you. It's going around and round and round. Look what you did last week. Look what you did last month. Look what you did six months ago. Look what you did six years ago. When the sinner came to the sanctuary and he put his hands on that lamb, it was transferring the ownership of everything that he confessed to the priest who would bring it into the sanctuary. Isn't it a wonderful thing that when you confess your sins, you don't have to own the guilt anymore? You don't have to own the shame anymore. You don't have to own the sorrow of that anymore. Now, the sinner always, Leviticus 5 verse 5, he shall confess that he has sinned in that thing. So confession was always, as we pointed out last night, specific. Anger, bitterness, lust. It was the, the confession was very specific. If we come to God and say, oh God, if I've sinned, forgive me. Oh God, if I did anything wrong yesterday, forgive me. We will continue to carry our guilt and condemnation with us. But when we come and confess the specific sin and in our mind imagine that the guilt of that sin is being transferred to the Lamb and that we no longer own that guilt, we no longer own that sorrow. Now, who slays the sacrifice? The sinner slays the sacrifice. Leviticus 4, verse 33, read it with me, please. And he, and who's the he, everybody? The repentant sinner shall slay it for a sin offering in the place where they kill the offering. So the, the sinner must slay the sacrifice. And I want to spend a little more time meditating on that with you. There is a wonderful statement in a book called Great Controversy, page 418, that says this. Day by day, the repentant sinner brought his offering to the door of the tabernacle, placing his hand upon the victim's head, confessed his sins, thus in figure, transferring them from his self to the innocent sacrifice the animal was then slain. So the sin is transferred from the sinner to the sacrifice. The animal is then slain. Now, incidentally, Maybe not so incidentally, a couple of things that are really significant. You see this altar here in the court. Some of the blood from some sacrifices was poured out at the basin of this altar. Some was put on the horns of this altar. Some of the blood was taken into the sanctuary and put on the horns of the altar within the sanctuary. Now, through the blood, there was a record of sin in the sanctuary. So the sinner confesses his sin over the head of the lamb, slays the lamb. The priest takes some of the blood into the sanctuary, sprinkles it before the veil because that's where the law of God is and uh, indicating that the law of God that was broken is, is atoned for. But there's an interesting little truth here. Some of that blood was put on the four horns of that altar of incense and some put on the four horns of the burnt offering. A record of sin was there. Satan comes to you and Satan says, look what you did 
three weeks ago. Look what you did six months ago. And what do you say to him? The record of my sin is in the sanctuary covered with the blood of Christ. The, bl the, the blood placed on the horns of the altar records the sins that are forgiven. Why four horns? From the north, south, east, west. God speaks to all humanity. See, that's why we're not fearful in the judgment. That's why when our names come up in judgment, we don't tremble in fear. Why not? Because in heaven's sanctuary, there is a record of our sins, but that record is a record of sins covered by the blood of Christ, saved by the grace of God. The priest then took the blood from the animal, sprinkled it before the veil in the holy place, indicating that the law of God that had been broken was now atoned for, placing it on the horns of the altar here, so that indeed a record of sin forgiven. When the individual sins were transferred to the sanctuary, they were hidden from human view and nobody could see them because they were covered by the blood of Christ. When we confess our sins, they are hidden from human view. They are hidden from human view. They're in the sanctuary covered by the blood of Christ. Now, there's something else that's really fascinating here. Not only was the blood taken into the sanctuary, what happened to the carcass of the animal? What happened to the body of that animal? Most of the body of the animal, in a few instances, some of it was eaten by the priest and brought in, but most of the time it was burned here. How much of the animal was burned there? All of it. Because when Christ hung on Calvary's cross, he was consumed by sin for us. So all of it was there. What happened when the animal was consumed? There's an interesting word for offering that I just picked up. And you know what that word for offering is? The, the Hebrew word for offering has the idea of ascension, ascending, ascending. So the Christ, the sacrificial lamb for us, the smoke ascends as a sweet perfume to God. And Christ dies on Calvary's cross. He lies in the tomb and on Sunday morning, he's resurrected, and he ascends to heaven as our sacrifice, just like he was consumed in type in the sanctuary, just like in type the smoke ascended, he ascends. Now, here's an amazing truth. Jesus resurrected from the dead. He's getting ready to ascend to heaven. And just as he's there getting ready to ascend to heaven, Mary comes. She has tears running down her face. She thinks that a gardener has stolen away from the body of Christ. And Jesus says, Mary, touch me not, for I have not yet, what's the next word? Ascended to my Father. Now think about this. The most significant event after the cross in the history of the universe is to take place. Christ is to ascend to heaven and appear before the universe indicating that his blood settles the controversy between good and evil that all humanity can be forgiven, that all humanity can enter into the gates of heaven. He has the most significant announcement to make to the universe and he's going to ascend to heaven after his crucifixion. He's been there gone 33 and a half years, but he's ascended to heaven. But look, he stops and does not ascend because one of his children is crying and brokenhearted. He thinks so much of Mary, that the whole universe must wait until he comforts her. What a Christ. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. He knows when your heart is broken. He knows when the sword has pierced through your heart. He knows when sorrow fills your eyes. He knows when tears run down your face. And the living Christ pauses before the whole universe to speak hope and courage to your heart. The Bible says, Psalm 32, verse 1, blessed is the man, that's the Hebrew word asher, it means happy, contented, full of joy, full of peace. Blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Covered with what? 
covered with the blood of Christ, to know that you're forgiven, to know that you're justified by His blood, to know that you are His child makes all the difference in all the world. You know, Hebrews 10 verse 4 says, it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. So it's not possible that some human sacrifice, but what was God's intent with all this? God's intent was to show us through this about the sacrifice of Jesus. In all ages, man's only hope has been the Jesus Christ, the true sacrifice. In all of the ages, Satan's tried to condemn us. In all the ages, Satan has tried to make us feel unworthy. In all the ages, Satan has tried to make us feel that we cannot make it. But all the ages, the sanctuary message says to us, you can make it, my brother. You can make it, my sister. One night, Martin Luther went to sleep, and, in that, and as he went to sleep, he had a dream. And in that dream, he saw Satan in his dream. Some people think it was a vision of Satan, mask Satan coming down to Luther, but he describes it as a dream. And he said, in that dream, it was all darkness. And Satan opens up this scroll, and on that scroll are sins and sins and sins and sins. And, and Satan opens the scroll, and he says, Martin, is this the scroll of your sins? And Martin looks back, sees what he did as a 16-year-old and as a 12-year-old and as a 21-year-old, and he says, I have to admit, these are my sins. And then Satan says to him, is the wages of sin death? And Luther says, yes, the wages of sin are death. Then there's no hope for you. And Luther says he's there in his bed, it's dark at night, and he's just trembling, he's just shaking. He says, there's no hope for me. And then he notices that Satan's hand is over something. And Luther looks at the devil in his dream and he says, move your hand. The devil refuses. In the name of Jesus Christ, move your hand. Amen. Satan moves his hand. And above his sins are these words, by the blood of Christ, Luther is forgiven. And if we confess our sins, he's what? faithful and just. In all ages, man's only hope has been Jesus through your sacrifice. The hope is not in you. The hope is not in me. The hope is not in our good works, because whatever good works you perform, they're not good enough, because heaven requires perfection. We come to Christ. His grace forgives us. His grace pardons us. We come as we are, and He changes us and he begins to work out in us his own character. But God always takes the initiative in salvation. He takes the initiative on the cross. He takes the initiative through his Holy Spirit. He takes the initiative to work in our lives to transform us. John says in John 1 verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. When you behold Christ on the cross... When you behold the perfection of his life, when you behold his love, when you behold his amazing grace, when you behold his goodness and mercy, something happens inside of you. It changes you. It makes you over again. 1 Peter 2 verse 24 says, who his own self bears our sins in his own body on the tree. Jesus bears the guilt that we could not bear. Christ's grace is unmerited, it's undeserved, and it's unearned. That which motivates us to serve Him is what He has first done for us. If you begin trying to live the Christian life with the outer, you will always fail. If you say, I'm going to grit my teeth and clinch my fists, and be obedient to God if it kills me. It may kill you, because the stress of your life will drive you crazy, because you will find that in your own strength it is impossible. But if you behold the Lamb of God, and you see that His grace is unmerited, that it is undeserved, that it's unearned, and you fill your heart and your mind with His goodness, His mercy, His compassion, and His love. Something happens inside of you. It breaks your heart. Because you see, He died the death that was ours so that we could live the life that was His.
He wore the crown of thorns so we could wear a crown of glory. He hung on a cross so we could reign on a throne. He was judged as a criminal and condemned so we could be judged as righteous. He wore the crown of thorns so that we would not have to bear the pain of eternal death and we could wear a crown, a diadem of glory. He had nails driven through his hands so we could hold a scepter one day. He was hung upright on a cross so that we could sit royally on a throne. He is the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. The dying lamb speaks of a love so amazing, so divine, that it would rather take the guilt and penalty of sin upon itself than ever have one of his children be eternally lost. Many people, when they study the Christian faith, miss this point. And this point is the very heart of the Christian faith, and it's this. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, the Scripture says, He that hath no sin became sin for us. Did Jesus ever sin? Never. But did Jesus become sin for us? He did. Galatians 3, verse 13 says this, Cursed is everyone that hangs on the tree. So what killed Jesus was not the nails through his hands, not the crown of thorns upon his head. What killed him, Hebrews 2 verse 8 says, he tasted death for every man. So Jesus bore the guilt of every sin ever committed from the days of Adam on the cross. The magnified guilt of that broke his heart. That's why Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What did he mean by that? He was dying the death of a condemned sinner. He was experienced the weeping and gnashing of teeth. If Jesus only died the first death, there is no salvation for the second death. What is the second death? It is the conscious sense of abandonment from the presence of God forever. So when Jesus was hanging on the cross, although he had previously said, destroy this body in three days, I'll raise it up again. When he was hanging on the cross, he could not see himself coming through the tomb. The darkness of the tomb surrounded him, and he was dying the death that the sinner would die. In other words, he was willing, if necessary, to go into the grave and never come out for you. He was willing to be separated from the Father forever. That is a love beyond human comprehension. There is nothing like that in Buddhism. There's nothing like that in Islam. There's nothing like that in Hinduism. There's nothing like that in any religion in the world. That God comes and willing to give up all eternity for you and for me. So there's a wonderful statement in a book called Desire of Ages. You know, in the Library of Congress, there are well over 5,000 books on the life of Christ. In 1948, W.E. Beaumont, who was the librarian in the Library of Congress, was asked, what's the most significant book on the life of Christ? And he said, there are many, but for spiritual insight, for me, I'd take the book Desire of Ages. And in that book on the life of Christ, it's, there's a statement that really touches my heart. So great was his, this agony that Christ experienced on the cross that physical pain was hardly felt. Satan, with his fierce temptations, wrung the heart of Jesus. Don't you think Satan was saying to Jesus, it's not going to be worth it. Give this up. Call 10,000 angels. Give it up. Satan, with his fierce temptations, wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. So Christ hanging on that cross, was, his heart was wrenched. He was torn apart because he had existed with the Father from all eternity. And he feared that their separation would be eternal. Christ felt the anguish. This is what the Bible teaches, that the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. It was the sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as the sinner's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. So he's hanging there, nails through his hands. 
blood running down his wrists, tortured in physical pain, but the guilt of every sin of Adam is upon him, and he's hanging on that cross, and his heart is torn apart from God. The Father, the Son, who have that intimate relationship from all eternity. And he says, Father, if that's what it takes to save Mark Finley, if I have to go into the grave and never ever come out to put him in heaven forever, love so divine, that is the story. It is the story of grace, the story of a Savior's love beyond measure. It's beyond human comprehension. Sin brought all of heaven pain. And that's why the man who sought forgiveness when he slew that sacrifice must see the pain in the lamb so he could sense the pain that was in the divine Son of God. And that's why Zechariah 12, 10, as we read last night, says, when they look on him whom they've pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps for his firstborn. When we really understand the cross, when we really understand the magnificence of his love, when we really understand the majesty of his grace, when we really understand what he did for us, we say, Lord, I want to turn loose of sin. I don't want to do anything that brings suffering and pain to your heart. Some time ago, there was a young couple sitting in a funeral. It was one of the saddest funerals you could possibly imagine. They sat there in the front row. They looked at the casket of their five-year-old boy. What made it doubly, triply, quadruply painful was the father had killed his own son. When daddy was going to go to work that morning, his son had said, Daddy, I love you. And daddy went out and got in the car. He didn't know that the little boy had opened the door of the house and was wanting to see daddy and ran in back of the car to wave goodbye to him. Father backed up the car and backed it up over his son, and that boy was killed instantly. You can imagine the brokenheartedness of that father. You can imagine the sorrow of that father. You can imagine how at that funeral, that father just wept and wept. But when you and I come to Calvary, we face an infinitely greater tragedy. For we see Jesus slain, not by accident, but by our deliberate sin. And we say, Jesus, if that's the cost of sin, I want to turn loose of it. If that's the cost of sorrow, I want to turn loose of it. I love that song, that poem by John Newton that once wicked slave trader who came to Jesus and he writes, in evil long I took delight, unawed by shame or fear, till a new object met my sight and stopped my wild career. I saw one hanging on a tree in agonies and blood who fixed his languid eyes on me as near his cross I stood. Sure, never till my latest breath can I forget that look. It seemed to charge me with his death, though not a word he spoke. My conscience felt and owned my guilt and plunged me in despair. I saw my sins, his blood had spilt, and helped to nail him there. Alas, I knew not what I did, but now my tears are vain. Where shall my trembling soul be hiding? For I, the Lord, have slain. A second look he gave, which said, I freely all forgive. This blood is for thy ransom paid. I die that thou mayst live. Thus, while his death my sin displays, in all its blackest hue, such is the mystery of grace. It seals my pardon too. Coming to that cross, we find what our sin did to Jesus, but we find mercy we find grace, we find pardon. One of the great purposes of the sanctuary service was to reveal the cost of sin. Every sacrifice offered reveals that sin had its price. And although Jesus offers salvation freely, it cost heaven everything. Jesus gave a ransom for you that's far beyond comprehension. When you put your hand on a stove, and it gives you pain. 
And you go back and put it there again. As we said last night, it gives you pain again. You keep putting your hand on the same stove. It must not have hurt you that much. When we look to the cross and we see how much pain sin brought to God, we see that we want to surrender it forever. James 1 verse 15 says, Sin, when it's finished, brings forth what? It brings forth death. The reason pain, sin brings such pain to God is because he knows ultimately it will bring forth death. Our sins nailed him there. And it's the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Without the blood of the Lamb, no forgiveness. That blood pointed forward to Christ. Without his blood, there is no forgiveness. None at all. In the great controversy between good and evil in the far reaches of the universe, Christ is in heaven tonight for you. And he's saying to you tonight, my child, forgiveness is yours, grace is yours, mercy is yours. But there's one final act. And it's this. When the priest came out of the sanctuary, one final act in that courtyard, when the priest came out of the sanctuary, he gave to the sinner a knife, and the sinner must do one more thing with the dead carcass of the lamb. Here's what it is. Leviticus 4, verse 31. And he shall take away all the fat thereof, as the fat is taken away from the sacrifice of the peace offerings. So the sinner took the knife of the priest. He had to then... As he had killed the lamb, he had to go and he had to carve all the fat out of that lamb. The fat represents sin. The priest shall burn the fat upon the altar for a sweet savour of to the Lord. And the priest shall make atonement for him and it shall be forgiven him. The person had confessed their sin. The blood went into the sanctuary. But the person had to be determined that they were going to give up sin and give up that thing. So they had to take the knife and cut the fat out which represents sin. When we come to Christ, we don't come saying, oh, Jesus, I just forgive my sin, but I'm going to go do that same thing again. I'm going to live like that way again like I have. No, in our imagination, we say, Lord, I want to be done with that thing. I want the Holy Spirit with the sword of the Spirit and the knife of God's Word to cut that sin out of my life. This act in the sanctuary service powerfully illustrates that we must cooperate with God in allowing the Spirit to speak to our hearts and take away those things that are not in harmony with his will. The fat that is burned by the priest is a type of the final destruction of all sin and all wickedness because when that fat is burned, it is a symbol that at the end all sin will be burned up and all sin will be consumed. Psalm 37 verse 20. The wicked shall do what? Perish. And the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of the lambs. They shall consume in smoke and they shall consume away. This is sanctuary language. The fat of the lambs consumed. That is the sin gone forever. The message of the sinner trimming the fat is a solemn warning and an urgent appeal. It's an appeal by Christ to you and to me. It's an appeal to come with our lamb, to know that we can be forgiven. But it's also an appeal to say, stop fooling around with sin. Stop playing games with God. Stop cherishing those things in your heart. Come, Jesus will forgive you. Come and say, Jesus, take the fat of sin out of my life. As the song says, I was wandering down a path to nowhere, but then Christ reached out. Christ touched me. Christ forgave me. Christ changed me. Oh, Jesus, cut the fattest sin out of my life by your Holy Spirit so I can be a new man, so I can be a new woman. That grace pardons us. That grace is his unmerited favor. That grace is his goodness and his love. But that grace not only pardons us, but that grace changes us. You can never come to the cross and be the same again. Because at the cross, we find what sin has done to God. And his love flowing from the cross moves in our hearts and changes our lives. You want to bow your heads with me just now and say, Jesus, thank you for your grace and forgiveness. Change me inside. Make me the person you want me to be. Our Father in heaven, we thank you tonight.
for your grace, for your goodness, for your mercy. We thank you for your love. We thank you for that blood that pardons our sin. We thank you there's no condemnation in Christ. And we thank you that although we come to the cross as we are, your love changes us, it breaks our hearts, and that at the cross there's power to be different people. And we praise you for that, and we leave here singing of the grace and goodness of our God. In Christ's name, amen.